Right. Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Joe Stevens. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, a company named Whispering Gibbon. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, virtual content and physical content. So how things that you see on screen um, in VR experiences can be brought into the real world as physical items. So um, just a bit about me and my background. So I'm a programmer by trade. I used to work for some of the big AAA game studios. Um, and within that, my role was specifically as a graphics programmer. So I used to build the technology that the games were built upon. Um, and I guess that's, that's very much the focus of the company and what our skill set is. Um, within that as well, though, we've got experience of 3D printing, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about as well. Um, and how those two things interact, so 3D graphics and 3D printing stuff. Um, I founded the company back in 2012 because of that skill set that I had and a, and a group of very talented people had in 3D programming. And we were really excited about um, what was happening with 3D in general, so VR, um, 3D printing, uh, AR, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a bit about the background. In terms of the company itself, I uh, should probably explain the strange name. Um, so we started off life as a games company, um, and that's why we're called Whispering Gibbon. Um, so we used to play a game in A-level physics where uh, somebody whispered Gibbon person next door. You had to say it louder and louder and louder until our expanser physics teacher kicked you out. So it was the idea that anything can be fun in the right context. Um, but as I said, we're first and foremost, we're 3D tech specialists. So we, uh, in the early stage of the company, did a lot of the groundwork for um, some of the really high-end uh, 3D experiences you'll see. So um, specifically within that, um, our, the, the groundwork for Audi and Pagani's virtual showroom. Um, and then we started looking at making our own games, which would work for VR, so this was back in 2012, so it was, it was quite early to be doing that kind of thing. Um, so we started developing games where absolutely everything within the game was 3D, so there was no 2D content at all. Um, and that, that's what you really need to do to, to be able to make something work in VR. Um, we, we started doing that, and um, we realized that then that fitted really well with 3D printing. So you, you, everything you're making is, is 3D content. It's specifically for being seen and, in, and interacted with in 3D. Um, so we tried to 3D print um, some user-generated content from a game we were making. So the game at the time was uh, virtual bonsai trees. So you would plant a seed, uh, you'd water it, and then a 3D tree would grow out of this and you could chop branches off, bend them round. Um, uh, and you could create something in the virtual world which people would find really hard to do in the real world. So the idea was then these items are unique for each person. They can print them out and you can't kill your bonsai tree, which believe it or not we have, we've killed two. So, uh, so that's where we came from in terms of the company's journey. Um, and I guess... So now what we do is we focus on enabling other companies to, um, to make the most of their 3D content, so unlock its potential. So what we've got is we've got a, a platform which any experience, uh, 3D experience can drop in to their, um, into their code base and it enables 3D screenshots of content to be grabbed and taken out of that experience. Um, and then um, there's a full merchandising um, cycle around that, so you can buy these things, these 3D screenshots you grab out. Um, and what's enabled us to do that is we've developed a piece of technology called RenderFab, which is a cloud service which analyzes any 3D object, works out um, everything that needs to be fixed up to make it compatible with a 3D printer, um, and, and that process is fully automated. So that's what I'm going to talk quite a bit about is what it is about the 3D stuff you see on screen that means that you can't simply just print it out um, because it seems like you should be able to. Um, so if I just exit out of this. So this is the result of uh, what we've got. This is 
um, for a particular game we've been working with. And these are all 3D screenshots that have been grabbed from a game. Um, I've actually got this guy down here, so come up and have a look afterwards. Um, and this is grabbed out, and then people can select what material um, they want to buy this item. So you can buy it in steel, gold, silver, uh, platinum, if you've got enough money, but we haven't, so we haven't even tried that yet. Um, yeah, so more examples of that. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's roughly what we do. And I'll get back onto the more interesting stuff of um, 3D printing. So uh, is anybody in here 3D printed anything? Anything at all? No? Has anybody seen one? Yeah? Seen a 3D printed thing? And was it horrible squirted plastic? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what traditionally people think of 3D printing as. But it's an incredibly powerful medium. So first and foremost, you can use it to manufacture things which are unmanufacturable. So a good example of that is um, a chain link. So if you think of uh, chains being linked together, they're not, they don't actually come manufactured like that. They're manufactured in strips and then the links are joined afterwards. Whereas with 3D printing, you can actually print a uh, link chain like that. So a high level example, but I guess even these things up on the screen behind you can't actually manufacture something like that. Um, it takes 3D data as an input, and, and we all know there's a ton of 3D data out there, so you've got content from games and films, you've then got content from VR and AR, um, you've got stuff from medical data, architectural mock-ups, and then you've got all of your CAD data as well. Um, and then the really interesting thing is that it, things are printed in individual print runs. So um, traditionally when something's manufactured to make it cost effective you create some sort of die or cast uh, and that's used to print thousands and thousands of copies because that initial setup is quite expensive whereas you don't have that with 3D printed um, so you can print individual items um, more or less at the same cost that you can print um, thousands and thousands uh, and then the last thing is on location it's this is happening much more slowly than people anticipated and I I think there'll always be um, big commercial printing companies that will do printing for people, but uh, we're starting to see printers be cheap enough for people to actually have them at home and, and do useful things with them. So um, you can actually get something on demand there and then. Um, so what is 3D printing? It's, it's actually called additive manufacturing, that's what it is. Um, and it's a long established industry, so We've been hearing a lot about it in the last couple of years, but it's 30 years or so that it's actually been around. Um, and it's, uh, it, I guess it's, st it's still a very manual process. So people assume that because it's this awesome new technology that, that that's it, everything just works and it automates everything. But it only automates a very small piece of, uh, of the traditional manufacturing pipeline. There's still an awful lot of work that has to be done manually. Uh, so I went up with, over at the Shapeways factory in New York and uh, people are loading big vats of material into printers, they're taking them out, moving them into ovens and then moving them across the production lines where they're dusted off and sorted and put in boxes and had labels stuck on them. Um, but there's also a lot more finishing processes, so polishing um, and then there's pre-processing, which I guess is a lot of what I'm going to talk about as well, making files that will actually work with the printer and knowing that they'll print. Uh, but it is revolutionising manufacturing now, so there are Formula One parts, aerospace parts, which are actually in um, working um, mechanical um, machines which, which are 3D printed and, and couldn't be manufactured in, in another way. So, um, yeah, as I said, I guess most people's experience is with the squirted plastic, um, but in terms of um, commercial use, it's, it's, that's, that's a very, very small part of it. So you can print now in full color. Um, I've got bottles down here, so come and see me after and so I'll show you more detail, but you can print in metals, um, which a lot of people don't realize, but you can also do some more out there things like printing food, so people have been printing chocolate and pizza and stuff like that. So I guess how does, how does it actually work? We've said that it takes 3D data and there's a ton of 3D data out there. 
but there's still um, a process that has to happen between you having that 3D model that you're used to seeing and it going into the printer. So um, generally you'll have a 3D mo model file and it'll need to be in a specific format for uh, uh, to actually be used with 3D printing. Um, and then a lot of printers need to add supports to stuff. So if, uh, if I was standing here with my arms out like that and I want to print myself, um, in certain materials at certain sizes, you would need to print support structures up under my arms. So um, that, a lot of that's done in software. Um, and then finally, additive manufacturing is, is just that. It's, it's adding layer upon layer. So um, there's, a, there's a wide range of techniques that I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but more or less, all of them are, you create one layer, um, you then create another layer on top and you build it up layer by layer like that. So quite an integral part of um, getting something prepared for 3D printing is something called slicing. So if you look at the picture behind, uh, you can see a slice cross section through a model. Um, and then once you've done all that, so you've taken your model, you've added any supports you might need, um, and then you've created these slices from it, you then need to convert that into a language the printer understands. And again, there's, there's a lot of different ways that it works, but more or less it's controlling motors within a printer which move around uh, to focus on different parts of each layer. So um, specifics of some different printers and how they work. So we'll start with the one that people are familiar with. Um, so this is FDM, it's, it's the squirted plastic that people are familiar with. Um, and how it works is that uh, you have a print head which is heated and then you push um, a, a thin coil, um, like a wire of plastic out of that print head and as it comes through the print head and gets heated it melts. So you've got basically a, a runny line of melted plastic. And much like if you were piping ice and sugar, something like that. Um, so that's, that's sort of the one that most people are familiar with and it's, um, it's pretty low cost because there aren't, I guess warming up a hint print head enough to melt some plastic is, is reasonably simple. Um, but there are a lot of limits to it in terms of, uh, the, obviously the material has to cool and it's not that accurate um, and your, the accuracy of the model is limited to how thin that um, bit of plastic coming out can be. Um, so, yeah, so that's what most people are familiar with. Um, and then you come on to something a bit more advanced, like material jetting. So what happens in a technique like this is, again, everything's built up layer by layer, um, but the material is just um, tiny droplets. So it's very much the same as your 2D printer, um, only it just prints tiny droplets of a material. Um, and then cures it in some way. So um, whether that's uh, it's a plastic and you use UV light to cure it, much like when you go to the dentist and they put your filling in and they put the pen on it, um, it works in a similar fashion to that. And that means you can get a lot more accurate so you can do tiny droplets um, for each layer and build them up. Um, but this uh, yeah, I, I often requires support material and quite accurate support material. Then another technique is um, binder jetting. I think the last picture was uh, not quite what it was. But, uh, but anyway, uh, binder jetting is, is similar, to, um, similar to that in that you're putting tiny bits of a binding agent instead of the actual material itself. Um, but you have a bed of a powder that you're binding. So this could be like a ceramic-based powder um, or it could be steel. So I've got steel prints down here that are printed in this technique. Um, and so what happens is you've got a bed of powder, you drop basically glue or coloured glue of some description um, over, the, over a full layer and then you brush powder over the top again and then build up another layer and build that up slowly. Um, but generally there's a, there's a green state, it's called, within that. So you've got your object that's kind of been glued together and then you need to apply another process to that to set it and generally that means putting it in a big oven. Um, so for the steel for example it's bronze infused so the, the binding agent gets replaced with, bon um, with bronze and then creates the, the finished solid model. So 
Um, that green state means that there is potential for models to fail and break. But on the plus side, because you're printing everything in a bed of powder and the density of the, the powder in the bed is equal to that of the, the bound object, then uh, you don't need any support material. So you can, uh, you can print a lot more complex shapes without having to tear bits off them afterwards. Um, and then uh, direct energy deposition is, I guess it's, uh, it's a bit, it's, I guess this is the one that is sort of much more industrial. Um, and what happens here is that tiny bits of metal come out of the print head and as they land, um, lasers are fired at them and sparks come off and it looks very impressive. Um, but that's, that's something that consumers don't really um, use that much. It's a um, much more expensive um, type of 3D printing. Um, um, and then you've got something which is a bit similar to that, which is powder bed fusion. So again, you've got a bed of powder, but this time instead of putting a binding agent into it, you actually fire lasers at it. So um, uh, you'd have like a bed of uh, plastic powder. Um, it's actually warmed up, so it's almost melted. Um, and then you, you fire a laser in lots of little dots, spread another layer of powder. Um, so you can see a lot of these techniques are very similar, and they're, based, they're all based on the same principle of spreading a layer uh, and then building something on top of it. Um, and then uh, another quite different technique is uh, VAT polymerized polymerization, if I can say that. So the way that this works is you have a big tub of liquid, uh, and this liquid is sensitive to certain types of uh, wavelengths of light, generally UV, uh, again, a bit like you're curing your fillings, but this time you have, instead of it being little droplets of it, you have a whole vat of it, um, and then a laser, um, or it can actually be um, just like a TV screen, um, projects light for each of the layers, and as it does that, um, it will slowly cure the, the liquid into a solid. So this is the one, I don't know if you've seen videos on YouTube and stuff where, uh, where you see something coming out of a liquid bath and it looks really cool and they always speed it up because it's not that fast. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting you can get really high resolutions with that and there's some in really interesting stuff around much larger scale printers going on with that at the moment. Uh, and then finally, um, believe it or not, you can 3D print in paper. So um, this is sheet lamination. Uh, and more or less what it is, is you're 3D printing, um, you're printing a single layer on A4 sheets of paper. So it's the, uh, one of the printers we've used that actually does look like a desktop printer. You feed A4 paper into it um, and it prints one single layer um, with um, an inkjet head um, put in um, colour which has a glue in it um, across the surface and then it cuts around the edge of that layer. Uh, and then you build up layer upon layer on layer on that. But th that technique is actually used for metals as well. They just use ultrasound to, to do the gluing around the edge, if you like. Um, yeah, so that's, that's more or less an overview of uh, the different printing techniques that are out there. Um, and um, I guess the costs of those um, vary quite a lot, depending on what the technique is. But fundamentally, it's, it's down to the, the physical size of the model. So um, the bigger it gets in size, you're actually um, getting, that, that's a much larger increase in the volume of the object. So if something's twice as big, uh, it's way more than twice the volume. So if you were to uh, if you were get, get a mug that's five centimeters tall and fill it with water, it's not twice as much water to fill a mug that's uh, 10 centimeters. So uh, the, the cost of models as they get physically bigger get, uh, get very expensive pretty quickly. Um, and the main reason for that is because you're using uh, material and energy um, and because it's not a straight, um, like a linear relationship between the, 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 what you see as the height or the size that you used to see and, and the cost it does seem to get quite expensive quickly. Um, but yeah, fundamentally it's the, the print vol volume and what material you're using. So I guess um, examples on this picture, these little ninja guys are 
user generated their um, uh, 10, 7, um, and 5 and 3 centimeters. And um, in full color, uh, if they were solid, that's you're talking roughly 25 pounds just to print it. Which, uh, if you think if you can go into a shop and buy um, a character for uh, a printed character in, in done in the traditional manufacturing sense for a lot, lot cheaper than that. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done to make 3D printing um, comparable in price to um, to normal traditional manufacturing. I'll talk a bit later about some ways that can be done. Um, so how do you how do you get access to printers? I guess we've talked about um, having one of your own on your desk. This uh, picture in the background, that's one of the printers we have in the office. So um, yeah, just to make it clear, we don't actually print anything. We send it off to big industrial printers to print because uh, some of the, um, the ones that I've just talked about, particularly the metal ones and even the sandstone, the, the full colored ones, the printers can cost about a quarter of a million pounds, so we couldn't possibly have a whole bank of them in the office. Um, so printers are getting much more affordable. You can buy a printer to put on your desk um, for about three, four hundred pounds um, if you go digging around on eBay. Um, but then there are a lot of local printing networks, so you can uh, uh, go on a, a service like 3D Hubs or something and find who has a 3D printer no near you and normally they'll just charge you a small fee um, for printing something out for them. Um, and then there are service providers where you can uh, log on to their website, give them a 3D file, they'll tell you whether or not it'll print and if it does then you can just buy it directly from them. So, so there's quite a lot of ways that you can, you can actually start playing with 3D printing now and I'd encourage everyone just to to go to, to start off, I guess, go, go somewhere like um, Sculptio or Shapeways or uh, iMaterialize. Um, I can, yeah, I'll give links to people later um, and, and just <coughs> send them some files and they'll give you feedback for free. You can uh, have a look at them and see what materials you can print in. Um, so why is VR so good for, for 3D printing? Uh, it comes back to what I said at the very beginning in that uh, everything is created in 3D. So uh, I guess a lot of VR at the moment is being driven by games, um, and games do tend to have quite a lot of 2D stuff in them. Um, you see particle effects, explosions, that kind of stuff. They're actually, um, a lot of that stuff isn't, isn't easily compatible with VR, um, whereas VR tends to, um, the content to be actual, real, uh, physical 3D. The, the other, really nice thing is that the users are really, really engaged. So I don't know how many people have actually uh, used a VR experience or played a VR game. Yeah, so most people here. And, and it is much more compelling than, than uh, playing a traditional game or, or just looking at something on the screen. So your users are, have a much um, higher connection with the stuff that they're interacting with in game. Uh, and they do interact with that stuff a lot more. So it tends to be that VR experiences are all about interacting with stuff as opposed to just watching stuff happen. Um, and the other thing is that you tend to be in these experiences for quite a long time if you were to add it up. Um, t I guess generally a film is sort of two hours maximum and that's it, you walk away from it. Whereas um, a VR experience and I guess specifically games within that um, average playing times are sort of uh, six hours a month, so that's that's a lot, um, a lot more. Um, I guess the other nice thing as well is that generally the way that the content's released is you get incremental releases, you get new content all of the time, uh, which keeps it fresh. Uh, and finally, a lot of it is is quite niche, so it's quite focused. So even if you're looking at something like a car showroom, um, it's it's a very focused product which is, is targeted at a particular person and I guess coming back to games again you, you we've seen growth in in genres such as horror um, and the people that use those exper experiences tend to be selecting them based on what genre they are as opposed to just playing the latest thing um, so if we are so brilliant uh, for, for um, 3d printing content and grabbing real world stuff out of your virtual experience, why, why isn't everyone doing it? I mean, how many people have, have actually 3D printed something from, 
from a VR experience. You know, I guess that's going to be quite a hard ask when there's only a handful of actually printing something. But um, I guess the main reasons are that you don't have ready access to that content. So when you're uh, browsing the internet or playing a game, it's quite easy to grab 2D stuff from that. And people are familiar with Pinterest. A lot of people um, share images of um, stuff on the internet or share videos. But there's no real way to actually share your 3D experiences, your 3D content. And that's one of the big barriers to entry. Um, the next one is, is access to printers. The, the fact that people, um, it, it is, I guess, if you want one on your desk at the moment, they're not uh, high end, so you're not really getting that quality experience from it. Um, and then if you're using a service, how do you get that content into that service to, to print and buy something? Um, and then um, you actually need a lot of expertise. So I talked briefly earlier on about what kind of content, uh, what kind of process stuff goes through to be 3D printed um, in terms of slicing and creating the layers. But there's actually a lot that happens before that, um, which I'm going to show you shortly. Um, and, and that is very labor intensive. So uh, a lot of people who print 3D content at the moment, they're hobbyists and they do spend quite a lot of time sitting there tinkering with models making them the right size, uh, filling in holes, that kind of thing. Um, and I also talked about the, the, the cost as well. So the cost is more expensive. So the, the proposition to the person who uh, wants this content has to be higher. So it has to be um, much, much higher for you to actually buy something if you're going to be paying sort of maybe 10 times what you would for, for a cheap figure from a film, say. Um, so I guess in terms of um, access to content and printers, that's why we created Grabit, is that that does all of that side of it for you. It grabs 3D screenshots and then sends it straight to 3D printing companies, uh, which send it in the post to you. So, that's, uh, so those problems are starting to be solved. Um, in terms of added value, you've already got that in, in VR in a sense, because um, you've got, you're much more invested in that object and in those items. They mean a lot more to you because you interact with them. Um, the, I guess a lot of VR experiences as well, it's, it's customized and um, e even if it's not fully user generated, which it is in, in a lot of cases, but um, user customized content, so it's something that's personal to you. Um, and then there are ways of reducing the cost of printing as well. So that's one of the things that as our tech does is, is hollow models out, which reduces the material usage, which then in turn reduces the cost. So we come to the, so this is kind of the trickiest one. So there are, there are sort of ways of solving the other problems, um, which we've solved, but other people have solved them as well. But then you come to the expertise. So when you look at something um, on screen in a VR experience, it's, that isn't actually what's there behind the scenes. So I'm gonna take you behind the scenes shortly and show you what is actually there. Um, but the main thing is that when, when something is drawn, um, when the computer decides to draw something, it's, it's not very fussy about what it draws. You can throw stuff at it, at it which doesn't really make sense, which isn't really there, um, or you've cut a lot of corners to, to get it there, and, and it will just display it for you. Whereas a 3D printer, if you give it something which, um, which you're taking a lot of shortcuts on, which isn't physically there, uh, that's it, it'll just say, no, I, I don't know what it is, I can't print it. So I guess this is what we call the um, virtual physical disconnect. Um, and th that's the, the, the really big problem that we're trying to solve. So within that, you've got, uh, you can see this picture behind me, quite a good example is there's a, a leaf a a, um, next to a branch, but it's not actually attached. That branch is very thin, it could probably snap off. Um, and, uh, and there are various things with the, the visual integrity that I'll talk about in a bit as well. Um, so I'm going to take you behind the scenes um, with VR. So one of my friends made a game called Chair a Room, which he's very kindly said that I can uh, show you what's actually happening behind it. Um, but just to highlight what VR has to do differently to games. So this is a, this is a something you're probably quite familiar seeing. Um, if you're not, then this is basically what each eye is seeing. So um, 
uh, each, uh, the, you have two slightly different images which are then projected to your different eyes. Um, what this means is that for a VR experience, everything has to be drawn twice. So you draw everything as if this eye's seen it, and then you draw everything as if this eye's seen it, and everything is shifted very slightly um, from how, it, how it's seen. Um, so more or less, uh, roughly speaking, that means if you want it to run at the same speed, so you want it to be able to be processed and drawn, then uh, everything has to be um, half as costly to, to draw or take half as, uh, half as long to, to actually be displayed on screen. So that means VR actually cuts um, even more corners than, than games does in a lot of cases. So um, things they do uh, quite often is have a short draw distance. So that means you actually don't, you don't see for a long way in the experience. This actually suits it quite well as well because a lot of experiences work best when you aren't moving around. So um, a lot of the games and experiences you'll notice are in fixed rooms. So that means that you don't have to um, display stuff that's behind the doors. Um, then you have um, like low resolution models that are used. So um, if it's low resolution, it's quicker to draw. Um, and that's another way that, that um, experience are optimized for VR. And then finally, more simple shaders. So uh, a lot of VR experiences tend to be quite dark as well, and that's quite a nice way of, of hiding the fact that uh, you aren't doing such fancy things. Uh, right, I've just given you the recap a bit early. Um, So, yeah, so I'm just loading up what you see behind the screens in a game. So this is um, the game that I was talking about, um, Chair in a Room, and this was developed um, by uh, a friend of ours, so he's kindly let me show what goes on behind the scenes to you. So I guess this is kind of what people would be familiar with seeing. You know, you're in a room, you can look around. There's a few objects in here. But if we're to take a step back, so what you don't generally see is what's behind all of this. Um, so we zoom out and, th and that's it. So first of all, there's, there's actually nothing beyond those walls. Um, you can see as well that uh, you can see through um, the room here, the walls of the room. So what happens is um, generally when you're making 3D models to, to be displayed on screen, um, you don't draw the back of stuff because nobody sees it, so and, and it costs you to, to actually draw it. So a lot of that kind of stuff's missing. Um, and then if we look at individual models, so look at this um, glass bottle, for instance. It looks, it looks pretty much like a glass bottle, looks nice. Um, but if we look at it more closely, um, you can actually see that it's made up of quite a coarse structure. So if we look from a different angle that you wouldn't normally see it at, it's not a cylinder at all. It's, uh, it's got quite hard edges. So that's another thing that, that um, 3D content, uh, tricks to making 3D content actually draw much more quickly. Um, so again, if we look at it from here, it looks nice and smooth. So what, what's going on is that um, this simple information is being passed to be drawn, um, but then uh, you've got light in equations which work out where the light is and where the model is and instead of drawing the exact hard edges you say that this is meant to be smooth so at that point you you actually display it as if it's smooth um, and then if we were to look down here as well um, if I can click on this so so this is obviously quite detailed um, a bit of text on the floor, but if, if we look at it, uh, if I can, I'll just show you how it's actually made. So that is just a single quad, so a single square. Um, and what happens is that a texture is applied to it, so a 2D image is applied to the 3D square, um, 
and then it makes it look like there's a lot more than there is actually is there in terms of uh, geometry. So it appears to be much, much more detailed than it is. And this is, this is a common trick that's used um, in games, particularly for explosions and um, uh, bits of branches on, uh, sorry, leaves on trees, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so there are a few tricks that go on behind the scene in, um, in VR experiences. And the problem is that all of these aren't compatible with a 3D printer. So these are the kind of things that um, they come to be drawn on screen and that's fine. The, the um, GPU says, yeah, I, I understand what to do with that. But to a 3D printer, this is just a square. Um, another example is the walls here. So these walls can't possibly be printed as a, a 3D object because there's no depth to them. So how, how thick is this wall? We don't know. Um, and then coming back to the bottle, um, the 3D printer is going to print what is actually here. It's going to print this really harsh shape. It's not going to print um, what the model looks like uh, to you, which is this nice, nice smooth bottle uh, with rounded edges. Um, so I'm just going to show you uh, what you can do to fix that. So when you give something to a printer, it needs to be, um, because it's going to print it in layers, it needs to be just a single surface. So if you've got uh, bits of object that intersect or bits that don't quite touch, that does not compute to the printer. So this is a lot of, uh, this is the main reason that you don't see a lot of uh, 3D content from games and VR experiences being 3D printed because traditionally people, that somebody has to manually go along and they have to fix that so you have to find all of the edges that intersect you have to move them out and join them up you have to create uh, for a wall there you have to create a particular thickness uh, you would have to for the bottle you would have to make a really high detailed one where you model each of those bits um, and then I guess the other big problem is um, that you don't, uh, you, you're not paying any attention to how these things interact in the physical world. So, um, a good example of that is if you had a, a guy holding a massive axe and he had a really thin wrist, then um, a lot of materials aren't going to be able to print that without uh, the wrist snapping. Um, so, when you make something for a game, um, it's not it's not actually made with um, with those constraints in mind. So if I show you, so this is the, the same level again, and uh, we run it through our software, and now, um, hold on, I'll just turn these other things off so you don't get distracted. Uh, uh. So, so this is that model that's now been processed, uh, and you can see, uh, um, that first of all, the, the walls have thickness to them. So if we uh, yeah, go and have a look, you can see that there is actually a thickness there. Um, if we go inside, so we can actually look inside those walls that now have a thickness that didn't before. So if I can get the right angle. Um, so you can see right down the, the center of that wall. See so everything now in this scene is connected into one big continuous uh, surface um, and that can now be uh, be printed from that point of view uh, I'll show you some other examples so uh, here's the same room again it's just loading up um, yeah so basically what what we do is we automate all, all of the processes that, uh, that are currently manual so when somebody um, looks at one of those models, they then work out how thick they think the walls should be and they expand them out. Um, and then they fill in any little holes, they join any edges. Um, and that's what we've been working on solving those problems. Uh, so, uh, yeah, again, you can see another, another good example of a problem is um, this floating object here. So often, because these scenes are dynamic, things are going on all the time, you can't guarantee what state they're going to be in. Um, so you'll often need to reject things that aren't joined. So 
Uh, that's another big thing that you need to consider. Um, and then, so this is um, what your bottle would look like originally. So that's the bottle from the game. And you can see it's, it's recreated and it's created um, with a completely solid surface. Um, but you've got these hard edges that I was talking about if we, if we look from this angle. Um, but what you can do is you can reverse engineer what the eye sees, so that, that graphical pipeline, to then create something which is actually smooth. So here is a, a new version that is that, that created it completely in software, and now you can see that it is, uh, if we look down the side, it is actually perfectly smooth around, but it's still um, completely solid in a surface. And then, um, Finally, um, so this is the chair um, from the game, and the, the, one of the big problems I said was this disconnect between the virtual and the physical world, and not knowing um, what, um, how they would react in the real world. So what we do is we actually convert the models into um, a form that we can then run a simulation on and we work out the forces that would actually be on it in the real world. So this is the chair represented in that form, and you can mm -hmm. see the areas of dark blue are where more force is going to be applied to the model, so where it's likely to snap, or, or we can, you can plug in then different materials and different sizes, uh, and you can work out it, whether you can print that, or if you, um, it can automatically be fattened to make it stronger, or even strengthened inside, or supports put on it externally. So, so that's all the... the um, the processes that you need to go through to actually convert something um, from something that you see on screen to something that you can actually print. And, and I guess that problem of that disconnect between virtual stuff and physical objects is, is what means that you don't see, um, you don't, I don't actually see this uh, 3D content at the moment today, but as I said, those problems um, are all being solved, so in the next uh, probably six months, I would imagine you'll start seeing um, a lot of these experience, experiences giving you the option to, to grab and, and print stuff from directly from your uh, content you've made in, in the virtual world. Um, so it's solving the problems of the, the disconnect between the virtual and the physical content, the, the strictness of the printer and making sure everything's in a format that the printer can understand. So kind of a bit like a language that it, it understands. Um, and then analyzing the structural integrity so you know that something is going to print in a different material at a different size. And then finally, that visual integrity. So all that stuff that's faked in um, traditionally in VR and games is actually brought into the physical model. So yeah, to, to summarize, there's a, there's a huge opportunity for VR. And um, all of that tech is now there to to remove all of those barriers to entry. So, um, yeah, if you've got any questions, then I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and please come up and have a look at the models, and I'll explain each of them, what material they're printed in, and, uh, and what the process is, and how much they cost, that kind of thing, if people are interested. Thank you. Yeah, so has anyone got any questions? No? Printing times, how long they take to print, <laughs> how slow they are. Hello. Hiya. Um, you were talking that you could print in food, maybe. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that mean like super in the future we might be able to print food for, if there are famine issues, could that, could that be a way of helping, um, how is that? Yeah, I guess although you still need to transport the food there, um, I think in terms of, um, developing in, in third world countries, the, the big thing will come from um, maybe medical applications. So you can 3D print now um, customized um, medication, so pills for people that have, or, like one pill that has all of their daily needs in it. So you could have a printer sat there in a center with everybody has a profile, they go to it and it just dishes out their pills based on what their needs are for their area, if it's got malaria in it or that, that kind of stuff. So I think that it's more that 
um, because it's in terms of food, it's it's at the moment it's it's very much aesthetic. Um, so. Uh, can I just ask about the, the Grabit software? Um, so the, the VR experience would need to be compatible with that, or is the Grabit doing something clever that it's analysing the scenes in front of you? Yeah, so, yeah, so this is an interesting point because uh, it leads on to IP and who owns IP. Um, and I guess from, from our point of view, um, I remember having a PlayStation 1, and yeah, I am that old, um, and believe it or not, for the younger kids in the audience, you couldn't take a, a 2D screenshot of what was on screen. You weren't allowed to. And you had to buy a shifty box from uh, China to enable you to do that. And we're kind of still at that stage with 3D content in that people are very precious about it and the, the IP holders saying it's theirs, whereas in reality it is yours and it will become yours. It's, it's a matter of time. So from our point of view, um, our software has to be integrated into the um, into whatever the experience is, and that is because it gets round the problem uh, of IP now. But it's it's equally as applicable for just grabbing the content that is being sent to be drawn. Um, it's just that that would upset a lot of people at the moment. So, so sorry. What about games like Minecraft, mm -hmm. where users generate their own? models and stuff like that, are they for proper 3D? Yeah, 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 so um, I've got an example, I've got examples of um, content printed from Minecraft down here. Um, yeah, the interesting thing with Minecraft is that it is, um, yes, yeah, so it's all built in the 3D world, it's, it's, Minecraft cuts an awful lot of corners, m way more than most, but because it's nice cubes, that means that quite a lot of it can easily be printed. So you know the width of a cube, you can then relate that to a specific material and say this material generally has a minimum thickness that's printable of three cubes. So anything that's, uh, that's got more than three cubes attached to you, you can print and it's going to work. Or you can just change the size so you make it bigger and know it's going to print. So yeah, yeah um, there, are, there is a um, piece of software called Mineways which will... Um, grab your bits out of your levels um, and you can use that to print but it's restricted to very specific um, parts of it um, so for example you couldn't uh, the, the leaves that the, like the plants that are growing around the level um, you couldn't print them you can't print uh, the leaves on the trees for example uh, you couldn't print something that um, that overhangs uh, and you couldn't print stuff at different scales so if you wanted to print something really, really big and something really, really small, you couldn't do that. It, it would have to be the right size so that block size matches printer specification, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's no uh, one, take, so the it's no one taking advantage of that already. Sorry? There's no one taking advantage of that already in terms of when kids... Yeah, no, no, no. So this is, this is the interesting thing. And I think it's because people want it to be all or nothing. They don't want to say, yeah, you can print bits of it but it might not work um, and that, I guess yeah so that that was our motivation for solving the problem is that it has to be everything if it's not absolutely everything then people aren't going to use it and that's that's what we've seen um, so I guess in terms of so one of the the people that we're talking to is Microsoft so that's um, not, not specifically about Minecraft but that would be would be nice so good luck thank you <laughs> Hi there. Have you got any examples of how this has been brought to life in a learning environment? Um, see, that, that's another interesting que um, question because uh, so Minecraft do a lot of stuff with educational um, and, and that's something that's very interesting for us to get involved in that because, um, again, the problem is that, that kids create this content, or I guess even, even adults who are, who are learning create this content, but there's a huge learning curve between that and being able to get something that, that would print. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's another thing that we're looking at is, is how we can work with, uh, 
uh, so we're talking to Ultimega, Create, um, people like that. Um, and one of the games that we're working with, the, the TerraTech guys, they're actually doing quite a lot with education. So their game is about building these vehicles and mining planets and stuff. Um, so we're discussing how we could add the 3D print into that. So, um, But yeah, it's definitely a, a really interesting area. And I, I think the important thing is, is to actually give people feedback though. Because, so what we do is we just fix everything so it's guaranteed to print, but telling them why and what's changed would be a very important part of that, I think. Right, right. thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, please come up and have a look at all these models. I'll run through what materials are and how they're printed. So. Thank you.